Hello, CASW members, and thank you for joining us for another webinar. I am so happy to see your virtual names coming up on my screen, as always. If you haven't yet found that chat and Q&A function, please feel free to give us a little note and let us know where you're tuning in from. We're so happy to have you joining us today. This is part two of a three-part series uh, that we are co-hosting with the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers on spirituality and ethics and social work. So we are so grateful to our partners over at Nova Scotia for helping us put on this wonderful event and series. My name is Alexandra Zanis. I want to do a couple really brief little housekeeping notes so that we can get into the bulk of this presentation. Uh, hello, everyone. It's so nice to see you. I want to let you know, as always, that the CISW is located on the traditional, unceded, and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe and Algonquin peoples. And I am so grateful to be a guest and to be able to work, play, and live on these wonderful land. So thank you to the caretakers who have been here for time of memorial who allow us to gather now virtually on this wonderful, wonderful space. If you are looking for your certificate of attendance, that can be found at the end in that course completion tracker at the end of those blue and white icons. Um, those blue and white icons are called widgets. You can find anything you need there, including the housekeeping notes, the speaker bios, uh, the abstract for today's presentation, as well as the slides and the, and the video components if you accidentally close them. You can also take a minute and just customize your screen. So make sure it's the best for your viewing needs. If you want to make the slides bigger, go ahead. If you want to make the video bigger, you can do that. Just take a minute and customize it so it's the best for you. This offering will be on demand, so it'll be created as a recording. So feel free to log back on anytime. You can access the handout widget or anything like that if you want to log back on after. The certificate of attendance will only be sent to you about an hour after the presentation has concluded. So watch your email for that, or you can always log back onto the platform through your registration email and download it directly. With all that being said, I am on the back end today, so feel free to let me know in the chat and Q&A functions. If you do have a Q&A question, feel free to use that Q&A tab. Chat is more for general comments about the wonderful presenters we have and the presentation we are hosting today. So with all that being said, I would love to pass it over to Nadia. Nadia, thank you so much, so, so much for joining us. I am so grateful to have you here today and hosting this wonderful panel. Please take it away. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here as well. And um, so grateful to be speaking to you from Mi'kma'ki and um, to be representing the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers, which is in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And um, their inherent rights were recognized in the Peace and Friendship Treaties that were signed from 1725 to 1779 which did not surrender indigenous land, resources, or sovereignty to the British Empire, but instead established rules for an ongoing relationship between nations. And I invite us to continue to think of the, to think of the ways in which the lands, territories, and indigenous people who lived and continue to live within all of the lands that we are speaking from and listening from and how each of us individually and as a collective body of social workers can hold ourselves accountable to reconciliation with Indigenous peoples here and across Turtle Island. And I am so grateful to have an amazing group of panelists to be joining me. So session one, I talked about the ethical implications of integrating spirituality into social work from a very theoretical perspective. Session three is going to be looking at some concrete specific applications. But today is really about expanding our understanding of the different ethical opportunities and challenges that might be facing social workers as they consider this issue. And we have several different uh, speakers who will be joining us. And the first question that we will hear from them on is, what are the ethical concerns that you see about social workers integrating or not integrating spirituality into their practice. And so um, our first speaker is actually two speakers and they are anonymous. And I invite them to begin sharing. They've chosen to remain anonymous, but they are um, social workers who have very important perspectives on this issue. And um, so I invite them to begin. Are you able to hear me? Let's 
So my, my remarks have to do with the role of the environment and how it affects a person of religious faith to feel accepted. Um, with this in mind, I'm going to share two personal experiences. First, there have been times when I have reached out for my own counseling support. In all attempts, I have explained what I was that I was trying to do my best to adhere to my religious beliefs, but that I needed help. In one instance, a therapist immediately, immediately ridiculed my faith beliefs and discouraged me from adhering to them. In another instance, a therapist who had faith-based training was very understanding of my situation, but their faith-based intervention model was too religious for me. They started reciting from their scriptures, interpreting them, recommending I write songs or hymns or music to help me cope with my life experience. In this instance, the person was a good fit, but not the modality. In the end, the best match was a therapist who was open to faith-based traditions, allow me to express my beliefs and understanding, but they offered an unbiased, objective, and an outsider approach because I found myself looking internally to find the strength and motivation to change within the understanding of my religious beliefs. A safe environment where I did not have to be on the defensive about my faith nor be intervened upon by a different faith tradition. A second um, implication about ethics in, a, in addressing spirituality and religion for me has had to do with seeking religious accommodations in the workplace. My religious group adheres to the concepts of Sabbath day observance and Sabbath day worship. I know that we have a constitutional human right to be able to observe the Sabbath in the way that is stipulated by our faith tradition and on the day stated by the faith. I have found that many members of my faith group are either not aware of their right to seek such an accommodation while others are afraid to seek it because they fear facing unemployment, while others do not believe that it is fair that such a right exists for them because it gives them access to a right which others cannot access. It is concerning to me when a person of a religious group expresses how they wish that they could observe the Sabbath according to their beliefs and gain all of those benefits that they believe in, but they choose to forfeit their rights, either out of ignorance or out of fear. It's also been surprising to me that even at times the faith leaders are not aware of these rights. So I have had to educate faith leaders, employment leaders, and hiring officers, as well as clients at times. I've also felt the pressure of hiring managers waiting for me to accept a job offer when they know that the accommodation request is still being processed. I've also felt the pressure of co-workers inquiring why I have an accommodation when others may not. So again, my, my uh, message is striving to share the example of when I'm in an environment where I feel safe, I might feel open to discussing more about my faith, even the name of it. But when I'm in environments where it's seeming to be confrontational, I'm going to keep that closed in, not express that important part of my identity. Uh, my experience um, started early on when I was going to university and uh, we were asked to do a self-reflective uh, paper on what brought us to the professional social work. And so I took the opportunity to share that and I put in there my faith and I had mentioned God and so did you know capital G proper noun and that paper came back with the capital G slashed out. So as a student, I remember thinking, whew, okay, <laughs> that's not accepted here. Um, it's not really self-reflective. And so when I think about those implications and how that looks for clients, I think, well, if they've had an adverse religious experience, which Nadia has referred to in the past training, um, could we be creating barriers amongst students and also amongst um, our clients that would keep them away from something that may be very um, instrumental in their healing process. That's it.
Boynton to um, please speak to this question of um, how do we, um, how do, what are the ethical concerns that you see about social workers integrating or not spirituality in their practice from your perspective? So Dr. Boynton, you'll need to unmute. Um, okay. I yes, I hear you. It was unmuted. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me here today. And uh, this is such a, a very important topic. Uh, I think first we need to recognize that spirituality has always been present and innate within our practice. It's, it's deep in our roots. And so we really need to explicitly bring those things forward and really understand how to best go about addressing it, both in academia and in practice. Um, it's a diversity issue. It's an intersection of people's lives. It's a social justice issue. And uh, it also has uh, been and can be a source of oppression and marginalization as the, the two first speakers, uh, you know, gave firsthand experiences of that. And I think Nadia did a wonderful job in highlighting the last session that not including spirituality can be a problem. And it really is inconsistent with our professional values and ethics to not at a minimum, at least assess the spiritual domain for clients and those that we're working with. And, and by doing that, by, by you know, addressing spirituality, we first have to also be really clear around what is it that we mean by spirituality? Because many people lump spirituality and religion together. And for some people, those are very connected and for others, they aren't. And so we need to be having that conversation about, you know, what does spirituality mean? And, and then if it's not something that a client feels that is, you know, important to them in their lives, then, then that is okay. And we can also use some of the constructs of spirituality, like sense of connectedness, meaning making, sense of purpose, joy, passion, creativity, and we can use their language. So I think it's really important that we do that and not impose our language on them. So really, I think, um, as Nadia also highlighted last session, the first steps are really about being critical uh, in terms of your awareness of your own spirituality, your own personal beliefs, potential biases and judgments and assumptions that might come up. And, and then the second piece that fits with our ethics is really to gain that awareness um, and have spiritual humility, right? And, and to gain competence in the area. And I'd like to speak a bit about um, working with children and families. It's really critical uh, in the work that I've done, both in my practice and in research, is that children who've experienced trauma, grief, and loss seem to be sparked and catapulted in thinking about spiritual concerns, existential concerns, thinking about um, the meaning and purpose of events in life. The problem is, is that many adults don't feel that children, especially children, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, don't have the capacity to cognitively um, conceptualize spirituality. Yet in my research, I found the act actual opposite. I found them to be very deep, spiritual thinkers, philosophizers. And uh, so that's an issue too, is that um, we need to be aware that uh, this is a, an important domain for children and for families. And that also my experience and in my research indicated that children and families um, often had differences in their spirituality. And so how do you navigate that? That can be an ethical concern especially when it comes down to consent and informed consent. Um, and as you know, the, the age of informed consent across Canada differs, right, D between the provinces. So in some provinces, you might be able to work with a child as young as 12 without consent from their parents. And yet in other provinces, uh, you know, you have a mature minor status at the age of, say, 16 or 17. So really, that can be an ethical issue when you're dealing with this area, uh, as well as the differences in spirituality 
for children and families because children are integrating their spirituality from various areas. They're on social media. They're, you know, learning from peers. They're, you know, learning things in, in different areas as well as from their family. So at, they're integrating things differently from maybe what their parents have thought. And, and myself, I have encountered that. So that, that can be an area that can raise concerns for um, families. And then of course, children in foster care. You know, what? what is the impact of spirituality in foster care? And are there differences between the foster parent and the child and the family? And how do you navigate those things? And, and so this leads to the importance of consultation, having good supervision and consultation. And this can be difficult when supervisors or, or um, clinical consultants may not have the same level of experience with spirituality or the same learnings. And so I think that can be an area. Um, and then across cultures too. Within cultures and across cultures can be a really uh, critical area where ethical concerns can arise as well and, and where we might make assumptions. And so that concept of spiritual humility is really, really important important for us to embrace. So I think these are a lot of um, ethical concerns. I also wanted to touch on the first speaker talked about practices and interventions. So that's another area where I see an issue where we need to really think about what are the interventions we're using? What are the spiritual roots to those? And how does that fit appropriately and effectively for the client? And so I think the negotiating of interventions is, is a really important area for us to, to really think about. And how can we maybe adjust or tweak some of our interventions so that they are actually relevant and effective? And then I think the other piece that I wanted just to touch on is that many individuals who are coming for support um, do have issues in the same areas of connectedness, meaning making and sense of purpose. And um, if we can actually reframe some of the issues that are going on for individuals as spiritual issues, as opposed to personal issues and, and um, you know, maybe emotional issues, I think sometimes that could be super helpful. Uh, and so we want to be able to navigate that, although we need to be cautious there as well. Right. So there's areas of ethical concerns there. So um, an area. And then the last area I just wanted to quickly touch on was um, self-disclosure. And we need to really pay attention to self-disclosure and consider how and why and when we would be doing that. Um, and, you know, for many clients, it might be reassuring to know about your spiritual beliefs and um, for others it also might not be helpful. So how we go about that, you need to take some time considering your responses to that and develop, you know, a script maybe even of how you can share or how you can disclose those. So so those are just some of the things that that I've thought about and and you know in the practice and and I will pass it to the next person. Yes, Dr. Dolores Mullings, um, I invite you to please unmute and share a few thoughts um, about this topic. I thought, okay, am I unmuted? Unmute. You're perfect. Yes, perfect? go for it. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. So I'm at, um, I'm in St. John's, Newfoundland um, at Memorial University. And so I'm acknowledging that the lands on which Memorial University's campuses are situated is in the traditional territories of diverse indigenous groups. And I acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of the Biafic, Mi'kmaq, Inu and Inuit of this province. I also want to acknowledge my African ancestors whose shoulders 
I stand on and um, who has paved the way for me to be here today. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to share um, some space with you. And um, I will sort of look at this um, question in uh, three ways, um, denial, resistance, and not knowing. And maybe I should probably start with the not knowing part, but I'll just start with a, a story. Um, in another lifetime, when I worked in hostile shelters and sexual assault centers, um, I accompanied a woman to, um, to have a procedure that in her mind, she felt that was against God, that those were her words, against God's and against her own um, principles. And um, at the time, I you know, was doing a lot of exploration and questioning uh, my own spirituality. And um, I remember she and I had this conversation about how she felt and the level of betrayal she felt to her faith. Um, and as I was trying to support her, I felt that there was nothing else I could do but find um, a Bible verse to, to support her, to remind her of, you know, what, what the, the God that she was speaking about. So I actually called my mother. Who was, who was very strong in her faith, and she gave me Bible verses to read to this person. Now, I know that sometimes there is a, and that really helped her, really helped her, even though I must say, I didn't necessarily believe that way, but I didn't think it was my job to decide how that person should behave or believe or not. My job at the time, regardless of what my personal beliefs are, um, was to support this person and I it appeared as I did that. So where I go with that is that sometimes, you know, in the social work profession, we don't know. Um, we, we enter the profession, it's spirituality and as our speaker before says, we put spirituality and religiosity together and sometimes they mean different things for different people. And so sometimes people really just don't know. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to behave, but they have their own spirituality. And we know that in certain parts of Canada, um, formalized or traditional religion, such as Christianity and Islam, are the things that we see most often in some spaces. Not to suggest that it is it, they're the only ones, but those are some of the pieces. We also know that our all our institutions are at the foundation of uh, judo uh, Christianity. Um, just, you know, the, the, the holidays we get off, those are just basic things that we don't really speak about. Um, you know, whose ways of beings and knowings are celebrated or accepted. And so sometimes people just don't know. But what I want to say is there's a wide um, variety of spirituality, spiritual practices amongst people of African, Caribbean, and Black descent um, across Canada and across the globe. And if we be begin with the fact that our religions and spiritualities, we believe, predates Christianity, although a lot of African, Black, and Caribbean people are of the Christian faith. Um, Many of our own peoples don't know about those practices and reject them when they become aware of these ancient practices. And this is influenced by white supremacy and colonization that marked our black bodies, uh, marked our black bodies as not having spiritual connections with deities or anything for that matter with outside of an organized religion. That is known. So in the new world, the new world, uh, black people embrace Christianity, but meld Christianity and with, meld Christianity with different spiritual practices coming from the continent. So research is now showing, Pew Center did some research a while ago and, and 
found that eight out of 10 African Americans, we tend not to have those kinds of data, data in Canada. So I use the African American data. Um, Self-identify as Christians, but many of those young people say that they're not affiliated with any um, one religion. But African Caribbean and black people are observing many spiritual practices in combination with organized religious practices and other not so well known practices. So organized pra uh, religious practice would be Rastafari, Rastafarianism, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, and so on and so forth. And those spiritual spiritual practice that are, spiritual practices from continental Africa, people who were enslaved brought them with them um, and felt the need to practice while under enslavement. And the only way they could have practiced their spirituality was to blend it with um, Christianity and organized religion. So as a result, we have a number of different um, spiritual practices amongst our people. Now, because social workers may not know about these practices or they may see them on TV um, and they're vilified in particular kind of way or stereotype, they may think that these spiritual practices are wrong or bad or, and I'm using the term specifically, um, deliberately. They may think that they're bad or wrong. Um, and so people might not get the support that they need. So from an ethical point of view, that's um, pressing um, because regardless of where the individual is, they need to be supported in the way in which they need to be supported, regardless of what any of us think. If you, I bring you back to the story that I um, shared with you before. And so along this line, there is increased awakening amongst African, Black, and Caribbean people about what spirituality looks like for us and what it needs to be when we are receiving services, no matter where the services are. So from an, ethic, uh, from an ethical point of view, when people are refused service or quite often we'll hear social workers say that they can't practice with this person or that person because it's against their religion. Um, so the question I like to ask from an ethical point of view is where do we draw the line with um, social work practice and personal practice. And are they intertwined? Are they connected or are they not connected? And how do we reconcile this tension? Because, you know, I've seen it in social work classrooms. We've just heard one of the speaker speak about it um, in, in, in the practice. And so how do we reconcile um, those pieces? Um, uh, so regardless of what they do, it is important that social work pra practitioners work with themselves, not necessarily with the people that are coming to ask for support or the people that they're working with, but they need to work with themselves to understand how they, I guess, to understand how they see social work practice, exactly what is social work practice. Quite often we think, well, social work practice is helping other people. Well, sometimes it's not necessarily helping other people. It's helping yourself to understand the work that you need to do um, or we need to do in order to support people's um, agency. So I leave you with this question. I leave you with, with this first question. I leave you with this to ponder is by what means do we practice social work and from whose perspective? Um, and how do we reconcile that with um, ethical practice when we look at these different perspectives? Thank you. Much. Dr. Ifeyinwa Mabakogu, um, thank you for um, being our next speaker on this question. And just a gentle reminder, because I know we are all here for um, one hour and we've got several speakers, um, including our speaker that was missing at the beginning. So um, we're looking for, um, so if, thank you for speaking. Can you see my video? 
Hello? Can you hear me and can you see yes, me? We can, yes, we can hear and see you. Okay. So um, thank you very much. I'm um, from Dalhousie University, and I want to acknowledge that we I'm speaking on Mi'kmaq territory, and we're all treaty people. And um, like um, the previous speaker, I also acknowledge that this is also the land of the African Nova Scotians, where they've lived for over 300 years. And um, the when we talk about spirituality and social work, I would want to talk about the fact that we should always acknowledge that there is a multicultural explosion in, um, in Canada and the diversity that we, we talk about has to be recognized as more and more people come in that have experienced diverse trauma and um, that are often not acknowledged. And so the where we should actually begin is with the, um, the curriculum where many of us are only introducing um, spirituality as probably one week of our uh, course content. And so the curriculum has to actually be looked at. And when we have these conversations on spirituality, we always seem to talk about the um, clinical engagement and that always um, other practitioners that are working in the community, because I consider myself a community based um, social worker, although um, considering the, the type of work that I do since I work with displaced people, um, people might think differently. So I always look at it as a social work interaction. So where does spirituality come in? So when we talk about spirituality, we always link it with cultural competency. So if we're talking about cultural competency, we should actually be talking about spiritual competency as well. That makes us understand the diverse people that we're working with and also acknowledge their, their needs. And we it would be very difficult for us to even talk about um, spirituality and ethical issues where we always have so much power as social workers and we always consider ourselves as the unknowing social workers. Um, and you could see that from the anonymous contribution, which I actually um, acknowledge. And so when we talk about spirituality, whose spirituality are we talking about? Is it my spirituality as a social worker or that of the client? And if we understand um, the spiritual um, makeup and what spirituality actually means, because sometimes as other speakers have said, there's a confusion between spirituality and religion. If we understand what um, spirituality actually means, then we'll actually be able to engage in that initial self-awareness to understand ourselves and our beliefs. I don't see it as um, really taking on um, understanding so many religions, but that self-awareness that allows you to recognize the other person's um, humanity and then their their right to um, um, non-discriminatory attention to their problems. So I also see social work students and even practitioners coming in not prepared to attend to the needs of their clients. And so, and that also leads us to the curriculum as well. And then when we talk about um, students feel that the best place that they learn about practice is in the field. And that is always considered the signature pedagogy. And so what are the insights that are provided in the field for understanding how to deal with um, spiritual issues when they come up? come about. And I experienced that in my social work classroom, where students talk about supervision. Um, they meet a client and then the client requests for some spiritual intervention. They're not ready for it because the curriculum does not provide them with the assessment tools that integrate biosocial spiritual assessments. And so when all that is missing, and also we bring that into, into the field placement and supervisors are resistant because they don't have adequate training to support a spiritual intervention. That becomes a problem for the client because we're denying the client what they need. And then that client might go on being traumatized for several years, moving on from one place to the other to get the right services that they, that they require. And um, so I 
would also look at it as um, a person of African descent and knowing that spirituality is an important part of who we are, what we do, and how we approach different problems. And that is often denied within the curriculum itself as well and within practice, where we talk about spirituality. spirituality. Spirituality also aligns with our healing. It also aligns with our forms of um, practice. It also forms with how we look at things and how we approach our different problems. And I know that recently um, more and more social work classrooms are integrating Afrocentricity, but um, the problem again with introducing such um, um, ways of knowing is who are the students or who are the practitioners that we're training to actually um, practice those? And I take, for example, when I teach Afrocentricity in my classroom and I tell ask students, um, would you actually apply an Afrocentric framework for a client who actually comes to you and needs it. And I would say that while so many of the um, um, students that are um, of African descent would say yes, that they're able to use it, I would always have my um, white students say that they don't, um, they don't find themselves capable to apply this. And then there becomes um, debates within the classroom. Why is it that you can apply an Afrocentric practice where students are in the classroom learning within Eurocentric frameworks and being able to adapt to this even when it doesn't align with who they are and, and their ways of knowing? So all this resistance within the classroom, within social work practice is, is a problem that um, those are ethical concerns as well. And, um, and then I know that um, one of the previous speakers talked about um, spirituality in terms of who should we be applying spirituality with. And that often happens because most of the time I work with children. I worked with traffic children. I worked with displaced children. And several times they have come in to request a spiritual intervention. They don't have to say it but they tell you and the thing is how do you discern it you have to have the skills to discern what they're saying and what because the fact that they're children doesn't mean that they don't know what they actually need the the thing is that as social workers we come sometimes with um ideas about what our clients should actually be requiring and no matter how much they say it we do not hear it. So do we have the skills and the potentials to actually be silent and listen to our clients to hear what they say, different from what we feel that they're saying and what we feel that they need? Um, so I would just say that denying the client spirituality and its needs are, it's really a big problem in social work practice. And what should be done is actually um, engaging in more um, practice interventions within the classroom and also linking up with um, agencies that our students are going to be working with because those agencies have been people that are trained in certain institutions. And so they carry on what they have learned into those agencies. If we do not have spiritual um, courses or courses that integrate spirituality within our programs, then we'll just be um, replicating the circle forever. And we'll keep on having these conversations about spirituality without really enforcing it within um, the classroom or practice setting. So in summary, what I'm just going to be saying is um, it's actually um, part of our social justice um, obligations um, to include spirituality when our client knows it, when our client story requires it, and giving them what they want instead of um, what we want. And if we do not understand what they need and how they need it, engaging in them in ways that are respectful to understand how we should be applying it effectively. So I would just end there because I'm conscious of the fact that I have just um, five minutes. Thank you.
Yeah, I think we need a day long conference or two. And um, I'm grateful to each of you for um, helping us want to dive even deeper into this topic. I want to invite Major Ian Easter now to um, offer his reflections on the question. Hello, everyone. It's nice to be here. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm coming from uh, Edmonton, Alberta. Um, for Just for context, for the last uh, 13 years, I've been a chaplain in the Canadian Forces. Um, and since 2015, I've been a mental health chaplain, so specializing in uh, treating mental health. And in that capacity, I've had a number of professional colleagues who were uh, social workers uh, within the military. Um, I've also been a patient of um, a number of social workers. So I have an extremely high regard for your profession and I thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'm gonna try and keep this brief, but um, in terms of kind of the ethical concerns, I, I would say there's a, a couple that I identify. Um, one is, has to do with your own boundaries, um, keeping within your scope of practice, um, ensuring that you don't, if you're not a theologian, if you're not a uh, clergy, if you're not a religious leader or professional, uh, then make sure that uh, you don't act as if you are. Um, and that would be, uh, please you know, be careful to respect other people's beliefs and spirituality and uh, don't feel like you have to uh, enter into theological debates or uh, some forms of um, that can often be misunderstandings. Uh, the other thing is to be uh, very aware of your own biases. We've sp spoken about this already, but just uh, be aware that uh, your job is not to defend your views or to put down uh, your clients uh, views, uh, their beliefs, their their um, understanding. I think it's also important to realize that spirituality uh, can both be a positive force in people's lives, uh, but it can also be a negative force. Um, and I think being open and willing to explore both the positive side as well as the negative side. Um, and I think finally, um, recognize that one of the areas that we have not really engaged um, or identified within uh, mental health treatment is the reality of spiritual and religious trauma. Um, and so I think it's very important to do some under research and understanding that uh, that a lot of people carry within themselves uh, traumatic experiences um, and it um, regarding religious practices or their their faith, their experience of, um, of faith. Um, and there needs to be an awareness that um, talking about spirituality can be a trigger. And we need to be prepared to recognize that when we're dealing with um, someone who's triggered, it's often uh, a, a traumatic reaction. And so using all our skills of trauma treatment uh, in engaging with um, uh, helping the the client to process and work through the the trauma of their religious experiences. But uh, thank you very much, and I'll pass it off to the next person. Thank you so very much. Um, Chaplain Kirsten Wells, I invite you to now um, share some reflections on this question. Thank you very much, Nadia. Um, I am also in Halifax uh, under the same acknowledgements as the previous speakers from uh, this part of the country. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, I am a healthcare chaplain working in Nova Scotia Health. I am also an Anglican priest and I am a certified spiritual care specialist with the Canadian Association for Spiritual Care. And I want to acknowledge that I am not speaking on behalf of any of these organizations today, but on behalf of myself and the topic at hand. So um, I want to just say I'm so pleased to hear the level of dialogue and the great questions and concerns being put forward from the social work community. 
Uh, I wish I could talk for half a day about everything that you've said, but I'm going to try and talk about it. <laughs> but thank you. Concerns, a summary that I was thinking of. Um, I was thinking about spiritual care practitioners perhaps being among the most misunderstood healthcare professionals uh, going. Um, you know, people assume we might be witches or proselytes or Bible thumpers or a whole bunch of things. And some of the comments raised by speakers today indicate why people are wary of spiritual care practitioners, because sometimes people are practicing without enough competence. Their own self-awareness and the boundaries between their beliefs and their clients. And this is an essential ethical concern for spiritual care practitioners when thinking about um, our colleagues uh, amongst our own profession, but also social work. In healthcare, we work side by side with social workers constantly. And in my experience, it's healthcare has this binary attitude where it kind of pits a spiritual care professional against a social worker, like which one is going to be the best one to deal with the spiritual concerns. And this kind of attitude, it's a cultural experience in general right now. Um, and I really think that I'd like to see what I hear today, a more robust conversation around scope of practice, um, appropriate interventions, um, and collaboration and cross referral between these two professions in the best interest of the client. Um, I think that uh, those are my, my primary um, reflections on ethics. I mean, everything has to be focused on the care of the client, recognizing here to help, not um, I think it might be helpful for you to know that um, a lot of you have made comments about education and the need to incorporate spiritual uh, theory and practice into the, your education modules and experiences. Um, if you're wanting to check out your local spiritual care practitioner and find out, you know, how they how they fit in terms of their qualifications and education, um, I can tell you that those of us who are are certified with our association as spiritual care specialists have uh, approximately at least nine years of education in this area. Three of those. Uh, involve a master's degree in some form of religious education or profession. So although not all chaplains and spiritual care practitioners are clergy, uh, almost all of them have the same education as clergy um, in terms of divinity or theology. And then we have two extra years of exclusively clinical training in um, institutional setting, like a hospital, prison, um, our colleagues in the military, uh, we train hands-on under supervision in a, a residency type model for two years. Um, at the end of that, we get tested uh, to determine if we do have the appropriate skills to provide spiritual care competently and carefully in a way that does not harm other people. And that certification is reviewed every five years in order to keep um, certification. So the results of this are you end up with a, a highly trained religious leader of some ilk who is intensely self-aware of not only their own religious beliefs and values and practices, but the limits of that and the ability to assess and with the religious ideation of their clients. Um, there's a saying in spiritual care education that uh, we are the living human document. Uh, this applies to practitioners as well as our clients. Our job is to be the sharpest, good copy of the document that we can be. And we are held accountable 
for that. And um, I really, uh, it was difficult uh, to listen to um, the first speaker speak about um, that experience of not being seen uh, maybe as much by that practitioner who was, although recognizing they were doing a good job, but they, they didn't, uh, they missed the point in terms of what would be good for you as a client. And this is um, an essential ethical concern of us uh, in this field. So again, um, I'm just reviewing my notes because I get off topic and then I keep on talking. Um, oh, uh, yes, I think I'll just conclude by saying I did, I work with social workers currently um, in my present position. And I asked them, you know, tell me about spirituality in your practice and what you feel competent and confident about and what, what worries you. And um, the answers were like, I am comfortable assessing, I am comfortable supporting, I'm comfortable, you know, um, when things are going well and, and, and talking about it. What makes me comfortable is uh, issues of trauma, religious abuse, uh, requests for interventions around religious healing, and uh, leading prayer and ritual ceremonies. And I think these are all um, really in intersection um, because many of us have personal competency and or professional competency and our ability to reflect on our own situation professionally and decide, am I competent to provide what this patient needs or not? And if I am not, who to get this need met. So my colleague said, that's why I like working with a couple of uh, spiritual care practitioners, because when this comes up, I say, great, I'm going to refer you to them. And we collaborate from social work to spiritual care to meet the person appropriately. But I, I'd like, I'd be interested in your reflections of what makes you feel um, uncomfortable what makes you feel worried? Um, what are the what are the times in practicing spiritual care interventions where you think hmm, not quite sure where to go with this, and and what do you do in those situations? So I will uh, I will leave it there, and thank you very much for your attention and dialogue. Thank you so very much. Um, our last speaker for today is Fatima Rasti and um, Fatima actually has a PowerPoint that she prepared for us and um, there was actually a second part to this panel where um, I was going to ask all of our speakers to share some final words of advice but I'm aware of the time and that we probably won't get to it um, so what this does inspire me is I think we need to have maybe a day long session because there's so much more that we could dive into with each of the speakers. Um, and I'm sorry that we can't go deeper, but it's, it's certainly a, a great first step into what should be a much richer dialogue. So with that, Fatima, um, thank you for um, closing us out. Um, and thank you for so much for having me. Um, I'm, I, I'm really, I'm very grateful. Uh, and to you, Nadia, especially you and Alexandra for making that happen for me. And um, actually everything already been said, uh, what I put on my PowerPoint, I would be echoing what I heard already from my fellow presenters. Um, it, it's been a great experience being here. So what I did in my PowerPoint, I'm a big fan of PowerPoints. So guys, you know, just I uh, uh, added a few things together. So what I try to do is, uh, you know, put some thoughts together, what I think um, about spirituality, but, you know, my stance is not very different, but I already heard from uh, presenters and Nadia did a beautiful job in the last, um, in the first part of the series. Um, and then I, I brought some, because I, uh, my, 
you know, I have a clinical experience, I have a total experience working with clients in family 16, but in clinical setting it's been 11 years. So I thought I just put a um, few case vignettes for us to discuss uh, some of that. How does it look like spirituality looks like in the clinical setting? So that was the reason behind putting those vignettes together for us to have those questions, um, to think about some ethical considerations when issues come up, uh, some ethical issues come up regarding them. And then I put together a tiny toolkit for us. So we'll see how it goes because I'm very mindful of the time. We have just five minutes if I skim through uh, the slides. Um, and I don't know if I change the slides or how, how does that work? Um, Alexandra, do I? Hi, Fatma. Do you do you see the button that says next above um, on the on the bottom? Yes. Um, yes. So you can just click that next button and it should switch. Oh, okay. There yeah. you go. Perfect. Oh, it moved really fast. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, guys. I think it, okay. So I just put together, I'm just going to skim through those slides because that's been already, that's already been said, you know, the spirituality was an imperative component in the beginning of social work profession, right? In the 50s and 60s, it was all, um, so it, it shifted towards secretarian, but past two decades, there are more, uh, you know, talk and, and uh, some research, not enough research at this point, but there is research. Um, um, you know, uh, indicating that uh, there's some evidence, you know, this is research evidence that it is beneficial or it's, um, you know, it's an uh, important component within social work practice. Oh, sorry, I, I'm moving this. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, a, that's the right one. Okay, so, um, Food for thought. So these are just the questions for us to think. Um, um, is it appropriate for us as social workers to incorporate spirituality and religion in our practice? Because these terms in, in interchange. Is if yes, what is the significance of spirituality? Um, to me, spiritual beliefs can be uh, a strength. It gives purpose and meaning. Individuals may have strong moral code based on religious spiritual beliefs. It gives a sense of community and support, which can be a support in terms of in, in times of trouble and prayer and spiritual practices help individuals cope with physical and mental health issues. Um, and uh, spirituality is a human experience of, oh, sorry, um, you know, a sense of connection to something bigger than themselves and discovering meaning in life, purpose and values with or without God, God. Uh, broader and more comprehensive term than religion. Um, so I thought I put some um, case vignettes to, uh, together and they are a constellation of working with different clients and some of them they're coming from my um, colleagues. Um, I, I want to thank Hannah Rashid, she's a social worker, wonderful social worker and mentor to me. Uh, so some came from, from her. So the first one is, um, you know, you're a social worker who identifies as a person of color. You, you cover your head as part of your culture and religious belief. You're going to see a client with the family for the first time they use this. So it, it, it is the question of how much, if they ask, family asked you questions about your religious beliefs uh, and your culture, um, you know, how much you do, how much the use of self-closure, how much you disclose about your culture and beliefs, right? And um, so it, again, it comes down to what is beneficial for the family, uh, clinically speaking, that if you believe that your disclosure would be helpful uh, to the client, uh, but it's totally your clinical judgment or your, um, yeah. Sorry, I, uh, the PowerPoint is, is not there anymore, but okay. Um, the second one is, um, you know, you're, you're working with, um, you're working with a young child, um, client who, uh, who, who's on inpatient unit and has serious mental health issues and uh, sorry, physical health issues. 
Uh, and during a session, he expresses his desire to practice smudging as part of this spirituality. And um, your organization policies have certain rules around fire safety. Besides, there's no sweet grass available for smudging. So what role would you play to make smudging possible for that client? And what are some of the ethical considerations you would um, consider in this situation? Um, so the first one come, came to mind was right away was respect for the inherent dignity and worth of person and client's right of self-determination. But then it's a child. Um, and again, it was it was said before that different, you know, age of consent is different, different uh, provinces. Um, but as part of, you know, as best social work practice, you want to incorporate, you, you want to provide that opportunity to the child as well as the family to make that decision. So you would, you would consider that as well, their age of, you know, um, consent and their ability to consent. Uh, and then the advocacy piece, because you are working with an organization with, with certain policies. So how you make it possible for your client. And the, quickly, the third one is, um, so you're working with the, you know, fifth client in two months period who represents a minority religious group who have different beliefs and spiritual practices, which you have very little knowledge and information about. You are seeing the client for the first time for an intake session. And the presenting problem is anxiety and PTSD. Client is very friendly and you build a rapport with them with no problem. They are one of those clients who offer more information than asked due to their friendly nature and willingness to give you information. You have a strong desire and urge to get information and knowledge about their religious beliefs and spiritual practices. What would you do? Would you turn that session into a teaching opportunity for you? Um, so what are some of the ethical considerations, right? So uh, what jumped to me was in integrity in professional practice. So social workers establish appropriate boundaries and relationships with clients and ensure that the relationships serve the needs of clients. This is what has already been said. And religion, spirituality, exploration would only be discussed should the client elect to do so. So this one, I know uh, Ms. Christian Wells already talked about working with social workers closely. Um, so this is something I, I just, because most of us, we in social work practice, we, um, we work on interdisciplinary teams. Uh, we work with our colleagues from different dis disciplines. So this is something I put together. Um, and again, in this scenario where, uh, you know, uh, it didn't work for the family, the spiritual care service, it could be a number of things. I'm quickly just gonna read it. Uh, so you're part of the multidisciplinary team for trauma response team. Trauma response team is called in for a patient who went through a serious accident. Patients family members, immediate and extended family members are present to support the patient while patient in, is in, the, in ICU. Your role as a social worker is to provide resource provisions to the family. The child nurse called the spiritual care team services and a member from the spiritual care team is already present. Before you came, the spiritual care member is chanting and humming with their eyes closed. You can see the family member's facial expression, body language, which is making it clear for you to see that they are not comfortable with the chanting and humming. Um, how would you support the family at the same time, support your multidisciplinary team? Uh, because you know you have to balance that, that you are providing the best care, putting them, the client and their family in the center. And at the same time, you are um, balancing it with your team cohesion, your professional relationship. Um, so what jumped to mind was respect for an inherent dignity and worth of person, code of ethics, interdisciplinary team, team cohesion, advocacy for uh, patient's family. Uh, so the last but not least is um, even as social workers, when we are working with, with a family or client, um, you know, who identifies as if they are open to talk about their religious beliefs or their spiritual practices or their faith-based beliefs. And if you feel connected because you have the same similar beliefs and religious background or, you know, um, but at the same time, if they're language barriers, right? So what would be... Uh, you know, some of the eth ethical considerations in that case you would have in terms of, you know, if they're declining uh, a, a translator. 
So, um, and how do you, even you felt connected with them uh, because of your, you know, the, the spirituality or religious beliefs, but at the same time, if they're language barrier, how you feel connected with your clients. So um, what is our responsibility as social workers? Um, you know, it, for me, it's been said already, you know, expanding our knowledge base about, uh, you know, the negative and positive impacts of spirituality. It can be different. It can be on case to case basis and learning about human diversity in the concept context of religious spiritual beliefs. Uh, I heard, um, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name right, Piyawana, uh, she talk about multi-purpose, uh, multi, um, it's multicultural explosion in terms of, in Canada, people from diverse groups, they are here, different religious beliefs. And um, in, in that last but not least is seeking supervision safe social work platforms like today. I'm very grateful for that platform today that we are opening that discussion. So we can easily uh, or, you know, feel, by feeling safe to discuss ethical issues regarding spirituality and practices, um, you know, in our social work practice. So the toolkits, um, you know, well, what comes to mind from my clinical experience is, you know, engaging the client, rapport building, that transparency, what you're doing. Uh, that's That's been already said, the holistic approach, um, in, incorporating religion and spirituality and and seeing the person environment, right? And ex, ex, extending your bio psych, psychosocial model to the religion and spirituality as well. Um, and then doing some strength-based work with them. And listen to those client story. That's the first and foremost to me personally that I, I, I have genuine curiosity. I want to understand their narrative, deeper meanings which are attached to their story and their trauma, because uh, individuals seek for a story that helps make sense of the word, how they fit into the word. Um, and also, uh, I'm also a big fan of. Um, you know, evidence-based practices. I know ev not every practice can be evidence-based or overnight, uh, but, you know, what came to mind when I was putting those slides together is Marsha Lenahan's memoir. She um, she learned DBT or her DBT mindfulness skills or some of the DBT skills are based in, you know, her experience at Buddha, Buddhist uh, monastery and she went to a Catholic church in Germany. So, um, you know, so the evidence practices. Um, so information about spirituality and religious beliefs came into the conversation organically, like ask them open-ended questions, who or what provides you with strengths or hope, what gives you life, meaning and purpose, what is your greatest source of strength, what gives meanings to your life, how do you understand hope, what do you hope for, what gets you through the trouble uh turbulent, turbulent times um so that is it um you know it was all again uh, i put together those um uh, slides just based on my experience i'm not representing any group or my hospital where i work full time here in nova scotia halifax nova scotia um so yeah thank you so much for for inviting me and giving me that opportunity i appreciate that Thank you so very much, Fatima. Thank you to all of our speakers for um, sharing some perspectives. And, you know, I initially envisioned this panel as diving deeper to inspire us to want to learn more. And hopefully that certainly has been achieved. There's been lots of different perspectives and then some echoes, which only further reinforces the need to dive deeper and learn from one another. Um, and session three is going to focus upon some concrete skills but i i feel like i'm already thinking of a session four or maybe a series on education um so stay tuned i appreciate all of you for um being here and alexandra thank you so much for um guiding us through the end of this panel 
Thanks, Nadia. I don't have much else to say. Actually, what a wonderful uh, opportunity we have had uh, with the CISW to be able to partner on this series. So thank you to everyone, all of our members who have attended. As always, I love seeing your names. Please let us know when the survey comes up at the end of this presentation how we did. I read all of your comments and I appreciate them coming in. Your certificate of attendance will be available about an hour after this presentation has concluded. You can go to the CISW webpage, the webinar continuing education section to see part three as well as some of our other webinar offerings so feel free to go there and yes just thank you for spending this time with us we are so happy to see you and we will see you soon thanks everyone <laughs>